Amen. Amen. Hey, a couple of weeks ago, we kicked off this series called David, where it's about a small boy who becomes king. And he is a very unlikely person to ever become king. He is not only unknown in the nation of Israel, he is unknown where he is left out in his own family. There is going to be an anointing for the next king where his own family does not believe in him. And we recognize that God is going to pick an obscure, kind of unknown, un, uh, unpictured guy. He, he, he was just average. And he ultimately is going to become the greatest underdog story ever told. And from it, he would become the theme of movies and storylines and, and all kinds of things would be based on him. But it's going to begin by simply God placing an anointing that is unique and special to him. And right after this incredible moment, you think he would take over the palace and the kingdom and instead he does not. He actually goes back to a field to just remain faithful and to grow in stature and in maturity. He just remains faithful with where he's at. But if you know the story, it's going to kind of come to a peak where he is going to take on Goliath. There will be an unbelievable battle where there is somebody of incredible size and mass and a small boy is going to have victory and it will thrust him into the limelight, not only of the nation, but of the known world where his name will become great. And in the process, the current King Saul will develop kind of this sense of fear about him, insecurity, hatred, and it will not just move from an attitude, but an actual attack where Saul begins to try to kill this young man, David. And in the midst of this, we find an obscure, unique relationship between him and a guy by the name of Jonathan. And I think there's something in it for us today to find and to hold on to in the midst of all of this. Hey, I don't know how some of your greatest friendships began, but for me, one of mine was to a guy by the name of Sean. And it happened simply because he moved next door to me in elementary we were the same age, we were in the same grade, we went to a small school, and he lived next door, so we just hung out a lot. There was another guy by the name of Donnie, he lived about 10 doors down, and we became friends purely based off of proximity. There was other people in my life, we became friends because we were on the same sports team, and we would hang out and do fun things during the season, but that season would end, and I wouldn't see him for about nine months until the next year, and we would begin to uniquely connect again. I don't know how some of your unique friendships have started, but a unique one for me was um, Brian Boyd. When I was in about fifth grade, we went to a 4th of July picnic that happened in a park in Walnut Creek. And his parents and my parents knew each other from years before, and this was the first time Brian and I were ever going to meet, but he was about two weeks older than me, and immediately we hit it off, played at the park that day, and I did what a lot of you guys did growing up. I went to my parents and said, Mom and Dad, can Brian spend the night? How many remember spending the night when you were a kid? Perfect, mom and dad said yes, he came over. Remember, he didn't come prepared with clothes or anything else. This was the day when your friend came over, you just gave him clothes, right? A couple days later, maybe they, his parents washed him and sent him back, but that summer, about three to four nights a week, I either spent the night at Brian's house or he spent the night at mine. And a unique friendship began. But what made this friendship unique and different is that we started going to church together. And from that, I met a couple other guys, a guy by the name of John Jackson and Donald Baham and Mark and, and Jose and a whole group of guys that would be kind of become some influences in my life, even though, to be honest, I was far from God, not living for him, but the relationship influence would have an incredible difference on my life. It's amazing how faith friends are different than just regular friends. I don't know if you realize it, but friendships as we know it are really, for the most part, contractual or kind of I give, you give. They're, they're a, an agreement almost in this equal part of what's done or part. But when we come into a relationship of faith, we recognize that first and foremost, we get filled up from God and we have the, the ability to give into a relationship with no expectation back. And that was foreign for me, and it was different, and then when all of a sudden there was some positive influence, and it was this group of guys that was going to make a unique impact in my life. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says a unique statement, and I love its opening because it says, don't be fooled. In its simplest translation, let me summarize it this way, that you are not the, what's the word I'm looking for? You're not the Do you hate it when you want a word and it won't show up there? You ever have that moment? I didn't have that moment till a couple years in, ago, and, but it's happening more often. But um, you're not unique, like you're, you're the reality. Don't be fooled, you're not different. 
Bad company corrupts good character. Let me just ask a question. Whether you're a Christian, non-Christian, go to church, don't go to church. How many would say, I agree with that passage? The wrong people in your life have the ability to, to kind of create this unique impact to your life. Well, if that's true, let me challenge it with the opposite, that good company inspires great character. That when you put the right people around you, it so impacts you in ways far beyond you would ever know. And I didn't realize that just putting myself around the right person would change anything. Now, can we be honest? You can do some really dumb stuff with friends, right? Like there's just some things that on your own you would never do, but you get around friends, that same group of friends and I, we went down to Mexico when we were in high school and we found out just outside of Tijuana that they would sell fireworks to minors. Now, we loaded up all of our money. We literally bought hundreds of bottle rockets. We went out on the beach with a lighter and bottle rockets and lit them and pointed them at each other where we played three-on-three bottle rocket war. (laughs) Can you realize, does that sound, we all made it out okay, right? Like, you're looking at that, that sounds horrible. You would never do that by yourself. So we recognize that you'll do some really dumb stuff with friends, but it'll probably be really, really fun. I've heard this statement, that a really good friend will bail you out of jail. How many have heard that statement? But a best friend will be in jail with you, right? Like, you're, you're, you're there, like, you'll really go. Now, as we look at this part, we, we recognize the negative influence. But this unique group of friends also was going to become the positive influence that would bring such a lasting impact to my life. And I didn't even know that it was happening, so I wanna bring a kind of a statement to us that we'll wrestle over the next few minutes, and it's this that my friends, my friends reveal my spiritual health. My friends reveal my spiritual health. Now, think of it in this way, because when you're here, you go, well, Ben, not all my friends are Christian. And, And I would say, awesome, not all my friends are Christians either. But I will tell you that my friendship with them is not just to do life, it is to be an influence, a blessing, an encouragement. And my hope is, is that they see that and know that. Also, that the people that I surround myself, my hope is, is if you saw who I spent time with, you would be like, man, those are some great people that I think are stretching and challenging. Who are the people that you're spending time with and in, like leaning into? Because who we spend time with matters. It has a significant impact. So I want to give us four takeaways of faith friendships or spiritual friendships that I think we can hold on to that will have an impact in our lives. The first one is this, that spiritual friends are a gift from God. These aren't just a chance, this isn't just by circumstance, this isn't that just randomly you ended up on the team, that more was at work than simply lining up. Over the last few years, I've developed a friendship with a young man by the name of Parker, who's been an unbelievable blessing in my life. Now, if you got to know Parker, you would recognize early on that he is just such a joy. He's one of those guys that your quality of your life goes up just by spending time with him. Have you ever been around somebody and the pressures seem to diminish and just the peace of life goes up? You know those kind of people? Parker is that kind of person. And my hope is is that Parker receives from our relationship and believes that that relationship is a blessing. But I'll tell you, I have multiple times in my life, our family, friends that believe our lives, the quality of our lives are better. The more time I spend with Parker, the better my life gets. Those are unique people in your life. And when you find them, you recognize that they're a gift. It's not just by chance that God is orchestrating, he's doing something, he's aligning something, things are taking place and happening. But in 1 Samuel 18, one through four, we're gonna find a unique relationship that you would have never guessed. And it's gonna show up in a unique way for David. And it says this, after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. Now, here's what it doesn't say, so let's just pause real quick. Jonathan is the oldest son, meaning he's in line for the throne. When Saul is done being king, Jonathan will take over, be the successor who will run the nation of Israel, who at this time is a superpower. It is the strongest nation, it is the most wealthy nation, it is the most known nation, and it is right now kind of at its peak of awesome. And Jonathan is in line, but look what it goes on to say was the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them. For Jonathan loved David from that day on. Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. Now recognize that last week we looked at this, that Saul is trying to literally kill David. 
And when all of a sudden David finds himself in the home where he should be completely isolated, completely alone, completely attacked, God is going to give him a friend and he's going to give it to him in the most unlikely person. The person that should have been threatened, the person that should have been afraid, the person that should have been attacked is actually the person that is going to befriend David. Because recognize this, that when you show up into the palace, it sounds awesome. But recognize that he didn't show up in peace times. He's showing up into a tumultuous house, into difficult relationships where literally the person there is trying to attack, divide your family, your people, everything else. And David is going to find himself in there. And then Jonathan is going to change the, unique, the uniqueness of the relationship. It says, and Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now, as you read this, you're like, this is unique. What's going on? It simply means that everyone could tell that David did not belong in the palace. His wealth, his clothes, his resource gave no thought to anyone in there that he should be a part. And when all of a sudden Jonathan recognizes this, he says, wait, you're not an outsider. You're my friend. So let me take care of you. And it says that he walks him into his, robe, his like royal closet and says, what do you need? He just takes care of him. Did you ever grow up having a friend that had a sweet house? And going over there, I mean, it was just fun. For me, this young guy that I mentioned, Brian, he had a tree house in his backyard. And when you're in elementary school and your buddy's got a tree house, that's the coolest thing ever, right? Like we slept in it, we hung out in it, we tried to cook up there. I mean, just did fun things because that's what guys, like we did. You're like, guys cooking tree houses? I guess we did. <laughs> we were tough trying to be, whatever, right? But it was like, he had a sweet house. This is the scenario, but all of a sudden, David's like, wait, you don't have to be an outsider. Show up to my place. Let me get you set up with a pair of Vans. Let me get you some sweet pants. You need a hooded sweatshirt? What do you need? I got you taken care of. By the way, let me put a watch on you. Let me put a ring on you. You need some sweet sunglasses. He's just saying, I'm taking care of you, and you're a part of this house. He's going, I don't see you as an outsider. I see us as equals. I want to make sure you know there's a place for you in this house and with me. But recognize it doesn't just stay there with that David sees and Jonathan sees each other as a gift. Even though there's hardship and difficulty, it moves on to say that spiritual friends sharpen each other. See, so recognize many of us have heard the statement, Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, a friend sharpens a friend. This is a well-known passage. As a matter of fact, in first service, there was a gentleman sitting on like the third row with this t-shirt literally on this morning with this verse. It's very known passage, but know this about sharpening, that the sharpening is not just a small kind of final finish. At first, it is a removing of the old, the broken, to make a clean, powerful edge. And a great friend comes in to take off the hardness, the oldness, the, the areas of rust to, to make something that's usable. And in chapter 20, verses one through four, it's gonna continue in the story, and it says this. David now fled from Nereth in Ramah and found Jonathan. What have I done, he explained. What is my cry, crime? How have, how have I offended your father that he is um, determined to kill me? Do you have a friend that will just listen? Somebody that will just give you an open ear for when you need to vent? Somebody who can show up and just keep it honest. For me, that person's Pastor Doug. I, I love that I can walk into his office and when I'm frustrated and something's not right, I can just begin to speak it out. And what I love about it is, is Doug doesn't try to fix the circumstance. He just listens. And I'll just tell you, as a guy, that's got to be so difficult, right? Because I'm sure he's got all kinds of great answers. But I think he knows more than anything, I just need a safe place to just let it out and just begin to vent it in all of these things. There's some incredible help to having a friend that will just let you be open and honest. But can I also speak to the part? But doing that to the wrong person is horrible. So Becky and I have just created a value that says we don't ever speak ill to the other person, to our parents. So I don't get to call my dad or my mom and just say, hey, Becky, man, let me tell you about the attitude she had today. Because that's not the environment for it. Instead, to my parents, they only have heard the good things. So my dad has believed that Becky is God's gift to humanity because I've shared nothing but that. So it's awesome because the relationship has between until he just passed been so sweet. Because he, he's only heard the good. 
My, my mother-in-law thinks I am a gym. She is so mistaken, right? Like if she's even heard a message, she should know that that's not the case. But Becky only shares the good because sharing that information with the wrong person could be so bad. Who is the person that we go to just listen? For me, it's one of the reasons why I love small group. I meet a group of guys on Wednesday morning that we do life with, and I'll just tell you, I'm better because of them. They sharpen me, they speak life into me, we open the word of God together, we challenge each other, I'm anticipating going. The quality of life we have is so rich, but it is a place that I can be honest and vulnerable and real. And I recognize that that's not an easy place, and some of you in here are going, Ben, I wish I had that. I don't feel like I have that in my marriage. I don't feel like I have a person that I can just vent and be open and honest with, that I, I don't feel like I can tell somebody that I feel isolated or alone or unwanted or unneeded. And I recognize that difficulty. And yet look where the relationship's gonna continue on. It says Jonathan's response, that's not true, Jonathan protested. You're not going to die. This is an incredible piece because David is literally being attacked by Saul. And you know what Jonathan's statement is? That's not true. You're not going to die. He's simply choosing to shoot him straight. He's going to be honest. He's going to be direct. Now, here's what's funny. It's not that it wasn't true, but Jonathan is choosing to see it at a higher level. He's saying, do you recognize, David, this is just the earthly, but there is a spiritual level. You've been anointed. God has a plan over your life. You don't need to keep your focus down here. You've got to begin to raise your eyes to what God's doing. This is an incredible friendship where he's calling him higher. And then look what it goes on to say. Tell me how I can help you, Jonathan explained. Do you have a friend that's just going to show up when needed? How many have heard the statement that you know a real friend because they'll show up either when you need money or you need to move? I mean, that's when a friend really shows, right? Like if they help you move, that's a ride or die. I mean, you're in. But on the other side, the other one is if you're doing a home project and somebody shows up, you need to know that's just a level of care. Who are the people in your life that when you have needs, when hardship happens, they show up? They're there. That was the relationship of David and Jonathan. Even though there's attack, even though it's coming from a unique place, he's going to make it happen. And then thirdly, a spiritual friend sees others as God sees them. A spiritual friend a faith friend sees others as God sees them. Becky and I had the privilege of being youth pastors here for about 20 years. No, working with students, I should say, for about 20 years. And, and we've loved the process building relationships with both middle school and high school students, and then of course with leaders has just been one of our joy, and the fact that we get to do life and ask questions and wrestle faith. But every once in a while, a student or a leader will go like this. They'll go like this. It typically looks like this. So Ben, how did you end up with Becky? <laughs> and in full transparency, I don't know to feel honored or offended, right? Like, I think the first one is like, you... Becky, right? Like, I see that. That could be offensive. Or the other one, it's like, way to go. you right? Like, it, how could this be? Now, I don't think they're exactly asking that. And of course, I don't take offense. And I, and I begin to walk through by talking. Well, I believe God was at work in it because she is a gift. Yes, we're sharpening each other. But there is a unique thing about this point that I think separated from me, from anybody else in Becky's life. And by the way, we did not talk about this. So I'm literally... I'm gonna expose this and maybe she'll tell you I'm right or wrong later, right? Like, we'll just see. But it was not unique that I think anybody else saw that Becky was attractive when she was single when we met. So when all of a sudden I show up and I'm like, hey, you're really pretty, that only makes me equal to seeing what a lot of other people saw. But I think what began to separate was not the fact that I had some gimmick or something else. It's that I believe I began to see some qualities in her that nobody else had begun to see. And as I began to talk and draw those out of her, all of a sudden she recognized that I see her with value and worth beyond just attraction. Because the attraction of somebody is the lowest denominator of their worth. That is nothing more than objectifying somebody around a picture. But when all of a sudden I begin to notice her work ethic and the anointing that God had on her and her value in ministry and her heart for family and her willingness to put in and go down there and serve and care and give, all of a sudden as these qualities begin to come up, I think she began to go, wait, this guy, he's a, he's a pretty awesome guy, right? Some of you are like, yeah, you're still not that awesome, right? Like, 
but we began to see people for how God sees them, for who they are. Jonathan is gonna do this for David in a unique way that is going to call him higher. It will change the dynamic of their relationship. And at the end of, verse, uh, end of chapter 20 and verse 30, it says this. Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan. And one of the strongest statements in all of scripture is said right here. You stupid son of a whore is what he calls his own son. He swore at him, do you not think that I do not know that you want him to be king in your place, shaming yourself and your mother. Notice it says that he's shaming you and your mother, but not Saul. Look what it goes on to say. As long as that son of Jesse is alive, you will never be king. Now go and get him so I can kill him. What a unique thought in all that's going on. So you recognize this about friends, that a real friend brags about your strengths and defends your weaknesses, and yet what does Saul do? He goes to the friendship and creates attack. And Jonathan is gonna respond in one of the most crazy ways. It says this, that Jonathan left the table in fierce anger and refused to eat on the second day of the festival. He, for he was crushed by his father's shameful behavior towards who? David. It doesn't say that he was bothered by what his dad said about him. It was that he was bothered at what he would say about David. It tells you the depth of the friendship and what was going on. It was clear that Jonathan was like, Dad, in this picture, I hate to say it, but you're wrong. You're leading from fear, you're leading from this part, but God is at work and there is a story that I'm getting behind and I'm getting on and I'm not going to tolerate you reaching out and attacking the man of God that I've created a friendship with. See, John saw, uh, Jonathan saw the anointing, the favor, the blessing that God had placed on his life and he begins to speak into who David is in a unique way. Hey, recently I came across a video and a few statements and it says that inside of every one of us is either a fool and a king or a fool and a queen. And yet who we choose to talk to or who we choose to recognize is who we'll bring out in any person. It's possible that you get around certain friends and the fool in you comes out and it's silly and it's wild, but around the right person and, and the qualities and your greatest behaviors and strengths will begin to come out of you. But I'll just tell you that we have a choice of how we choose to see people. Do we see them with their highest form of worth that as an image in how God created them or made them, or do we lower them down to their lowest denominator, which is their performance, and begin to recognize them only based on what they do or their actions? But can I take this to a little bit more real way to us either as parents or to us as spouses? So for just a second, can, because I'm a guy, can I speak directly to, to ladies or wives in the room and then I'll do the opposite? Uh, there's not a right or wrong to this. When we begin to speak or call out into our significant other, to our husband, when you begin to call into him the king that he is, I will just tell you, you will raise him to a different person. When you begin to seek, speak to him for his worth and how God created him and his value and his identity, speak to him as the spiritual leader who's been anointed over your home and over your family to guide, to care, to lead, I will just tell you, you'll take him to another place. And how you begin to speak about him will change how you begin to think about him and it will begin to change how he sees himself. Now let me flip it the other way and as I say this, you need to know that guys, I'm not speaking to you on how to speak to your wives, I'm speaking on how I'm growing, learning how to speak to my wife. That rather than seeing her as a person I am called to fix or change, recognize that she is who God made her to be with value and dignity, who I'm supposed to submit and humble myself unto as Christ did to the cross, even taking on flesh into the grave, caring for her, nurturing her, valuing her, giving her worth and dignity, not seeing her as an object. I'll just change, it changes my mind, it changes my heart, it changes how I speak, and it changes how she lives. How do we choose to see people? A great spiritual friend sees them for who they are in Christ, not just lowering them down to what's going on. And Jonathan is going to call the best out in David. And then in the fourth area, we see that spiritual friends strengthen each other both in faith and in the word. When I was growing up, I would be occasionally in the word, meaning I would feel guilty for never reading it, but when I was in trouble, 
to occasionally opening it up and seeing if it had some level of wisdom. And as I began to mature in my faith, I became a reader of the word and then later on a studier of the word. But what I've recognized though is now when I get to circumstances or I have friends, I need to have God's word in my life because there is a truth that his word brings that other things don't. There's just not... Like if all we do is just give words, I mean, it might be encouraging or hopeful, but I'll tell you, when word of God is spoken over somebody, it divides. It separates the pain, it brings out the truth. We're told that the word of God is alive, separating bone from marrow, muscle from tendon, and it's sharp. And we recognize that the word of God and faith is needed to be spoken into. In chapter 23, 14 through 18, it says this way. Now David stayed in the stronghold of the wilderness And in the hill country of Ziph, Saul hunted him day after day, but God did not let Saul find him. One day, dear Horus, David received news that Saul was on his way to Ziph to reach, uh, to search and to kill him. Instead, Jonathan went to David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith and in God. Notice this, that Jonathan is with Saul and this is going on and it says that Jonathan separates himself and goes to his friend and says, don't get discouraged. Know what God is up to. Keep going, keep running the play. Don't give up, God is at work. This encouragement, this, this leaning into his God's word and God's truth is going to be the strengthening part. And look what it goes on to say. Do not be afraid, Jonathan reassured him. My father will never find you. You are going to be the king of Israel and I will be next to you as my, as my father Saul is well aware. So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord. This incredible friendship that would come in the most unique, different way. Now, as much as I can't say I've ever had a friendship like that of Jonathan, what I have had is some unique friends that have been a support and encouragement I can look back at key moments in my life, and matter of fact, I can go back to December 31st, 1994, being at a camp retreat where I invited Jesus into my life. And do you wanna know the group of guys that were around me? That same group I mentioned earlier. The guys that encouraged me to go on my first missions trip, the guys that spoke life into me. I remember the day my mom passed away, and this guy, Donald, dear friend of mine, showed up at my house and literally for about eight hours just sat on my couch so that I would not be alone just was with me in the hard moments of my life. When things are going on, these are the ones years later that I still get to hear of what's going on through social media or the occasional call, when yet all the sports friends and all the ones, they're missing. And yet that common bond of faith has been the thing that has sharpened us and developed us. This is a unique thought, but do you realize that God is more for your friends than you are? That God is uniquely placing people around you to sharpen you, to develop you, to encourage you, to grow in your faith. So if we opened up with this big question, my friends reveal my spiritual health, then let me ask this. Are your friendships healthy? The people that you put in your life, are they shaping you and forming you? Are you better because of them? Are you thoughtful in, in the development of what's going on? Are you making investments in them? And is it an iron sharpens iron or is it clearly one way? Is there a need to be a realignment to to lean in so there can be a greater connection? So for some of us, I want us to begin to pray that God would bring godly friendships into our lives. For some of us, that we would begin to see how God created them and made them and begin to see them as God did rather than just people that we work with or we do live next door to. Can it be an iron sharpens iron where we take the step to lean out and to speak life and to sharpen another and open up our heart and life for somebody to sharpen us? And lastly, would we begin to get in relationships where we're encouraging and growing in our faith? Maybe it's in a small group. Maybe it's a part, like a one-on-one connection that happens over golf or going to lunch occasionally, but you take it beyond just the acquaintance level because your friends are directing your future. They're shaping your spiritual life and they matter. Can I pray for us? Dear Lord, I think it's amazing how you brought a unique relationship into David's life through Jonathan through the person that is most unlikely, the person that nobody would ever suspect. And yet, Lord, many times when we're in our darkest moments, like David was being attacked by the king, Lord, you brought a friend to him. Lord, if right now we're feeling alone and overwhelmed, could we recognize that you're bringing friends to us? 
It's the reason that you have the church, the body of Christ to come together, that we can worship with, that we can grow with. For some of us this upcoming week, it's having the courage to step out and finding a small group. For, for some of us, it's leaning into a friendship that says, can we get together? I just need to share with you what's going on in my life and I, and I need somebody. For some of us, that we're gonna make ourselves available and first be the friend to somebody else before we ever find the friendship. But in the midst of it, Lord, today, we pray that you would use relationships for us to be an influence and also for us to grow and to be stretched, to become more like you. Lord, we recognize that David needed Jonathan, but also Jonathan needed David. And so Lord, I'm grateful that we don't walk through life to do it alone. We get to do it in community. And so Lord, we pray your love, your peace, your strength over us. Right now, with every head bowed and eye closed, if you've never engaged on the greatest relationship ever, that of knowing our Lord and our Savior as our friend, then through a simple prayer, we can invite Jesus Christ to come into our life by simply saying, today, Lord, I choose to put my faith in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be the payment for my sin and the promise for my eternity. Right now, we recognize that without a relationship with him, we are broken and we are alone, and there is no fulfillment that we can ever find in our life. And through a simple prayer, Romans tells us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Lord, today I pray that you would move and stir in the hearts of individuals. And Lord, today in faith, we believe that some are coming to know you now. Lord, I pray that this would not just be a message we talk about on Sunday. I pray it would show up in our homes. I pray it would show up in our works, our families, our friends. And that Lord, all the glory would go to you. Again, Lord, the goal is to be more like you so that we could be a light to our world in your name. Amen. Hey, if you'll do me a favor and stand, we have one.